and cilians. The term amphibian also comes from the Greek word amphibii, meaning both or and bios means life. So um, also wanted to state frogs have long legs longer than their head and body. And then toads, on the other hand, have shorter legs and prefer to crawl around rather than hop. Uh, frogs are usually smoother and are a little bit more slimy. And then toads are dry and have a wartier skin. Um, so amphibians also metamorphosize and as they um, hatch, they actually start out in the water and use gills, but as they um, metamorphosize they cha and change, they actually start breathing air with their lungs. having technical issues. So an endemic species is a species that has only been found in one part of the world, which is uh, Southern Nevada, and Kevin's gonna go over their map. Um, endemic refers to the species being specifically found in this one area. Um, so because they're limited to such a small range, endemic species are usually really rare, but their populations aren't always classified as threatened by the IUCN. So as they as amphibians mature, they usually lose their gills and develop lake, like we said earlier. And um, they are usually benign and harmless even helpful as creatures that devour harmful insects and serve as an alternate food source. Um, also, um, oh, I'm sorry. So a number of salamanders such as the North American mud puppy and the Mexican axolotl develop legs but retain their larval gills and stay in the water throughout their lifetimes. This classic example of evolutionary phenomenon known as neoteny, the retination of larval or juvenile features in mature adults. All right, sorry about that, it's my turn. I was also having technical difficulties from the microphone part. So um, so what you should see here on your screen is a picture of a life cycle and I will be chatting with you very briefly about indicator species and what bio indicators are, what indicator species are. So we define an indicator species also called bio indicators in biology as an, organ an organism that the presence or lack thereof provides a clear signal about the environmental conditions and how healthy the overall environment is. In this case, the Amargosa toad that we're chatting about tonight, we do consider the Amargosa toad an indicator species wherever they happen to live. Um, and we'll talk about their environment just a little bit more in a little bit. So depending on the organism, in our case, the Amargosa toad, its population size and overall health can signal either a healthy ecosystem or an unhealthy one. So these indicator species are incredibly helpful for biologists to study over time and can reveal information about many factors in the environment, including uh, pollution levels, salinity, temperature stability over time, also nutrient or food availability for other species. Um, frogs and toads are um, 
in particular, excellent indicator species because they have highly semi-permeable skin that must remain moist for them in order to breathe. So their skin makes them bioindicators for the health of their environment because they are vulnerable to absorbing chemical pollutants in their habitat. Many have life stages that utilize both terrestrial systems and freshwater systems. And what you see here in the Amargosa toad life cycle is there are two um, portions of its life cycle where they utilize freshwater ecosystems in particular. It's adult stage, they do live on terrestrial ecosystem ground. Um, this also makes them sensitive to all environmental stressors though, even small ones that we wouldn't necessarily notice otherwise, such as a change in temperature, even by a few degrees, also UV radiation. So it's just something to think about. We rely on some of these indicator species to help tell us how healthy ecosystems are. And that's one more reason why Amagosa toes are so important. All right, I will pass the torch of power. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Kevin Guadalupe. I'm the native fish and amphibian biologist here out of Las Vegas. And I'm going to try to share my screen, please. Or I'm sorry, are you, are you still going? No worries, oh, jumping around a little bit. Never today. mind. That's okay, <laughs> you're totally good. So the Amargosa toad is our spotlighted species for tonight. And they have this light tan to olive green colored warty body with these dark speckles and these orangey brown spots. It also has what looks like a line running down its back or on the dorsal side of its body. And it was at one time considered to be a subspecies of the Western toad, but is now its own distinct species. And they can reach from three to five inches in length, so they are pretty small, but the females are slightly larger than the males, which kind of aids in the reproduction process so that the males can hold on to the backs of the females. The females produce up to 6,000 eggs arranged in the form of long strings, kind of like in that picture that Jess just showed. And the eggs are attached to the plants that grow near the streams or shallow pools of water. And their eggs can develop into tadpoles in as few as three days in pretty warm water. Otherwise, they usually take around two weeks and they require relatively open water that persists just long enough for the tadpoles to metamorphose into toadlets and leave the water. From there, they can live for up to 12 years. And unlike other species of toads and frogs, the Amargosa toad doesn't produce those traditional croaks that we might think of. If you logged on a little early, you, could, you might have heard that the alarm calls that the males produce. So the toad is pretty silent most of the time, except when they are threatened and grabbed, then the males will produce those chirps that we heard in the beginning. These toads are nocturnal foragers, so they'll feed on invertebrates such as spiders, insects, snails, and even scorpions during the nighttime. And they'll occasionally visit areas that have artificial light because that light will draw in those insects and attract them, and they'll use their, the Amargosa toads will use their sticky tongue to grab their prey in a sit and wait type of predator strategy. And outside of the breeding season, they don't need too much water. Like Jess had mentioned, they have that semi-permeable skin. So toads don't really drink water in the way that we might think out of their mouths with their tongue. Instead, they'll absorb it through what is called their seat. And a thirsty toad will absorb the necessary water through their seat patch located on their lower bellies. It is an endemic species, so it has only been found around the Amargosa River of the Oasis Valley in Nye County, where a lot of the land is actually private land, and Kevin will go into that a little more. But the adults forage along the water's edge at night and around the adjacent upland areas. And they occupy these riparian areas of the northern Mojave Desert where wetlands are pretty rare. The toadlets and adult toads prefer areas with lots of clean flowing or ponded water. 
and may be more dependent seasonally on the availability of those open water habitats than other species in the same family. But they are also found to travel a considerable distance away from those open waters to forage and rest. The adult toads will use vegetative and woody structure, rocks, and rodent burrows as daytime resting and escape in upland areas. And they're not too big of fans of cold and windy weather. They'll usually hide in those burrows until weather conditions improve. So the Amargosa toad was listed as endangered in the late 90s as their populations dwindled from thousands in the 1950s to just hundreds today. And some threats include pretty human-induced ones like development, harm from off-road vehicles, mining, groundwater depletion, but they also have harm from non-native species and major predators of the Amargosa toads are non-native, introduced, invasive species of animals like bullfrogs, crayfish, and catfish. They will eat the eggs of Amargosa toads and hunt immature toads, while burrows, like in this picture here, they'll trample through the valley and damage the habitat. These species occupy the Amargosa toads' habitat due to plenty of food and lack of natural enemies. So what is invasive? Um, invasive species develop widespread populations with little stopping them. So they can be non-native plants, non-native animals, or other organisms that did not historically occur in that area. Um, invasives are important to think about. Um, Michelle did talk about the habitat just a moment ago for Amagosa toads and threats. So we're going to jump into what invasives mean to the populations, what they can do, how they are threats. Um, so what is an invasive? And we mentioned that just a little bit. So when introduced into local ecosystems, invasive species can develop abundant widespread populations in hardly any time at all. Um, these um, widespread populations can negatively impact the environment, the economy, even human health or the way that we live, it really affects everything overall. Um, an introduced species becomes invasive when they have caused negative impacts on the environment and negative impacts for the species already living in that area. Not all introduced species become invasive, but it's never a good idea to introduce um, an animal or a species to any environment, whether that's your pet that you can no longer take care of or moving one species to another without proper knowledge or the help of a biologist. And even then you really have to think about what you're doing and we really highly do not recommend it. Uh, these, invas these invasive species originally developed in their own native environment and that is the environment they're used to surviving in in this new environment that they were introduced to, there are typically very different and very little, if any, threats or predators that can keep their population in check or at a healthy level. They essentially have a one-up on all the naturally occurring species in that environment. Um, so all the invasive species can very easily outcompete native species for basic survival needs, such as food, water, shelter, and space. It's important to remember, and I did mention this already, that some of these impactive native species are also endemic, meaning that they only live or occur in that one area. I believe Abby mentioned that, um, and might already be struggling to survive or might already be endangered. So this is a quote that I very briefly wanted to show everybody. I will read the quote for you. It says, keeping the species alive is part of keeping the ecosystem intact. Um, it is a quote um, that particularly mentions the relic leopard frog of which you see a picture right here. Um, but it really encompasses the idea behind all native species. And our goal is to maintain a healthy ecosystem and that includes all the diversity and the endemic species. So it's always important to think about 
the consequences of introducing a new animal or a new species to a particular environment. Um, so very quickly, I will um, chat about one particular invasive species, the American bullfrog. And you see the picture up here on your screen. I'll talk about the date it was first introduced, how they were introduced, their impact, where they can live, and what invasion looks like as well as removal. So they were first introduced into the Western United States uh, in early 1900s-ish. Most introductions have been associated with escapes from agriculture operations. Um, however, other pathways include bait used for recreational fishing, although not really anymore, um, escapees or releases through pet trades or people not being able to take care of their pets any longer, landscape ponds, research, and also teaching. So teachers in the past have often found or gotten their hands on a bullfrog and been unable to take care of that pet once the school year ended. So a lot of these pets were released, set free into the environment, but that is a terrible idea because they can become invasive. Um, they compete with and prey on native species. Very often they will outcompete native species. The American bullfrog can show up as aggressive and very invasive. Um, species in parts of the US where they aren't native and it's able to outcompete native frog and toad species within one generation, which is crazy. It doesn't just impact frogs and toads though. American bullfrogs will eat anything it thinks it can get its mouth over, including small rodents, birds, other frogs, other toads, which means it can have a detrimental impact on some of the threatened and endangered species or state listed species of special concern. They've even been shown to be cannibalistic if other food is difficult to find. Um, in general, bullfrogs are especially fond of slow moving open bodies of water. And that means that in the US, for the most part, where water is scarce and where modifications like dams have altered natural water courses over time, bullfrogs have a prime opportunity to outcompete other species there. Uh, like other invasives, um, once bullfrogs have invaded a space, they can be incredibly difficult to remove. This is due to part, or this is due in part to the large number of eggs that they lay. Um, females can lay a clutch of about 20,000 eggs at one time. And the fact that removing adults can actually improve survival of tadpoles since adult bullfrogs are known to be cannibalistic if it's difficult to find other sources of food. Bullfrogs can also travel nearly a mile in search of a new place to colonize um, if something happens to their initial home. And a lot of other frogs and toads can't do that because they have that semi permeable membrane that has to stay moist all the time. Um, this means that bullfrogs um, or can travel, you know, since they can travel so far, they can, they really have that one up on all of those native species. This includes uh, draining ponds or other water resources, which can be one of the methods for dealing with bullfrog invasion. Um, so if this, if this happens, if we do decide to um, uh, drain a water source, um, bullfrogs really, you know, they can just pick up and move and they don't really, uh, it doesn't really hurt their populations as a whole, whereas native species, it would hurt them incredibly. Um, so that's how invasive species, particularly the American bullfrog can have an effect on native species in general, but in, but specifically the amagrosa toad. Thank you, Jess. Mm -hmm. And now for Kevin's presentation, please. Hi, Abby. Do you want me to uh, remote control this? Do you want me to share a screen? You can share your presentation. 
Okay. We'll do. Okay, you need to stop. It says you need to stop sharing. Okay, moment. Okay, do you see, let me see, let me switch the screen. That's better. Which one? So you see the full screen version now? That looks good, thank you. Okay. All right, so thank you. Um, again, my name, earlier, sorry to butt in, but my name is Kevin Guadalupe. I'm a native fish and amphibian biologist here at a Las Vegas office. And I'm going to tell you a little about the status and the 20 year mark recapture history of the Amargosa toad within the valley that primarily was started in 1998 by a lot of my predecessors. I took over in 2010. And in 2019, a report was written on the mark recapture history and given, uh, giving population estimates of the area. Um, one, of, one correction I kind of pointed out on the chat was that earlier it was mentioned that Amargosa toad was listed endangered, but actually it was not, it was petitioned twice to list as an endangered species, but, um, and in my talk I get into why, and uh, it was mainly due to private landowners. So first though, I'll give you an overview. I'm gonna talk a little about Nevada, the history of the Endangered Species Act, which kind of complicated a lot of the survey methods early on for this species. Um, talk about the Amargosa toad, the, the petitions, the conservation agreement and strategies, and the surveys, which happened after it, and some future studies that we have in the works for this. Now, if you aren't familiar with Nevada Department of Wildlife, we're basically split into three regions in the fisheries. And I work mostly out of the southern region out of Las Vegas. And so today, most of my talk will occur out of there. And this region, it contains mostly the Mojave and the Great Basin and the Colorado River Basin is made up of north and south running valleys. And within these valleys are a lot of the species that occurs in these valleys are remnants of post ice age uh, lakes and rivers. And the species have been there since the ice ages and evolved to this landscape which is fairly dry. Another thing that I wanna point out, and this region is made out of these four counties, which is Esmeralda, starting from left to right is Esmeralda, Nye County here in the middle, it looks like a giant hammer, Lincoln County, and then of course where the large uh, amount of the pop human population lives in Southern, in Clark County. And the private lands, now a lot of people might know that Nevada is made primarily, or it contains a lot of federally managed land so we have Death Valley National Park here, which is national parks. We have the Nevada Testing and Training Range in this purple and pink here in the center. Uh, we have this light green, which is our US Fish and Wildlife Service refuges. Dark green is Forest Service. And a large majority of our land is managed by the Bureau of Land Management. But at least pay, pay close attention to these clear open areas. And these are the private lands in Nevada which closely overlay with a lot of our water that we have in our state. And a lot of the species that occur, aquatic species that occur in the state occur in that, that land or in that perennial, or in a lot of these dots here are springs. And it's very important for a lot of these species that occur here. Now, Nevada Department of Wildlife, or Nevada has four state protected amphibians protected by law and which species that we survey and do habitat restoration for. Again, the Amargosa toad is one, the Columbia spotted frog, the most southern population of the Columbia spotted frog, the northern leopard frog, which occurs in parts of Lincoln and Nye. And we have also the relic leopard frog in the Las Vegas Valley, um, but primarily occurs in the Colorado River drainage around Lake Mead. Um, the Arizona toad was also petitioned for listing, so we've been doing a lot of work on that species in Lincoln County. 
And of course, these spring systems are also very important for endemic species like spring snails, which some of these species occur entirely in just springs, some of them just a meter big and nowhere else in the world. Uh, primarily, most of my work is over these in federally listed fish species here in this region. And I'm primarily pointing this out just to show that a lot of these species protect the watershed from overexertion. And I will go into a little history of why and how that all started. Well, it started in a place here in Nye County. Now, I want to point out here is Beatty, Nevada. And imagine you're growing up in rural Beatty. You're surrounded by this federally managed land. You have, uh, in the 1940s and 50s, you have a lot of people moving out here and there's testing and tr uh, for uh, training for World War II. They're doing nuclear <laughs> explosions out in the 50s. Um, they're testing secretive aircraft. And then there's a story about the 1960s and 70s as the water started to get used in these valleys more and more. A group of scientists met in Death Valley and noticed that uh, they petitioned basically to save a species of fish that occurred at um, a small spring in the side of a mountain, which is known as Devil's Hole. Uh, for more about this, you could read Battle Against Extinction or just Google search Devil's Hole pupfish. Another story and talk that we gave earlier this year was about the front pool fish, which occurred in the front valley. Well, and there were three species or there were two species and three subspecies of one of those in the Prump Valley and one at Ash Meadows. But by the 1960s and 70s, uh, these fish became extirpated and a group of scientists saved these, about 29 of them in a bucket at UNLV. And by 1975 or 1973, the Endangered Species Act was passed but by 1975, the pool fish was extirpated or gone, extinct out of Nye County, and now currently lives at about four different refuge sites across the state. So that's just a brief history, um, but it kind of gives you some background of the importance of, again, look at where Devil's Hole is and Beatty and all the public and private lands. We kind of set up going into the Amargosa Toad Surveys. Now, initially there was very little access given because People in the valley didn't, uh, it was a pretty controversial decision about limiting the, the water withdrawal within some of these, for some of these uh, species. And a lot of people initially didn't allow surveys to occur on their land where a lot of these amargosa toads occurred. So I'm gonna go over the conservation agreement and also the surveys that did happen. Uh, Michelle mentioned earlier, now in the, 19, in the 1990s, they did petition, the Center of Biological Diversity did uh, emergency petition to list as endangered, but there wasn't enough evidence in 1996. And 1998 was when they first started to do the surveys. It was again repetitioned in 2008, but again, not in 2010, not warranted for listing. And the primary reason for a lot of that were a lot of these initial surveys into the valley had to occur on the public land. So on BLM land, where a lot of the water resources weren't because a lot of the water in Nevada is privately owned. A lot of the surveys initially were during the daytime when later we found out that the toad mostly is active at night. And so some of these properties where these initial surveys were occurring they only reported in some places 30 adult toads. But a lot of these toads, because it's the Mojave Desert, aren't out in the middle of the daytime exposed to the over 100 degree weather. And so there is a lot of fear of the Endangered Species Act. And some of the locals recall uh, some locals having toad stomping parties because they feared that an endangered species might somehow compromise their ability to, um, to use the water in a way However, we had to make a lot, and this was mostly my predecessors, made a lot of partnerships with locals who allowed, initially allowed these surveys to occur. They're like, oh, we've got hundreds of toads or thousands of toads all over our property. And Brian Hobbs um, was my predecessor. This is Shirley Harlan. She worked, or she lived there in the valley and she had a spring and she would notice that the toads would always occur. And then across the valley from her, we have David Spicer, who also owns a ranch. Uh, he's big into mining up there, and he also reported tons of toads out there. 
And so with this access on private lands, we we're able to do these surveys. And we gained a lot of partnerships in the Valley. First, we came up with a conservation agreement and strategy, which stipulated um, actions that the landowner can do, uh, allowed surveys and communicated between this and other federal agencies. So that we, we gained all these partners to do this, these surveys. And it was initially a 10 year program to do a mark recapture. So you're basically you know, going out for 10 years and reporting what the population is doing. The, the surveys um, primarily were at these four parcels. So it was Spicer Mall and Torrance, the Harlan Keel, Angel's Ladies, which at the time was an active brothel, and the Amargosa River around the town of Beatty. And again, it took all these partnerships to go out to the lands, to the town of Beatty, um, the local sheriffs, and kind of partner up and say, hey, we want to go out between 9 p.m. and 3 a.m. and do these surveys. And so when we went out, we go out at night, we use a pit tag, which is about, it's about an inch, maybe a little less than an inch um, tag that goes into the, the body of the animal. First, and then we'll also measure from snout to vent, uh, distance to water, the type of habitat that we caught it in. We take a GPS location, mostly after 2012 when the technology became more advanced. Uh, time and start, and then also surveys kind of varied between years. Sometimes we had two people doing the surveys, and then some years we had over 20 people doing the surveys, so it allowed more animals to get caught. And so here is at nighttime a, a group of people, including David Spicer, the private landowner, helping out uh, to process those animals. And here's a, a video that I can show you. Now, you might be wondering why I have a toad in a bag. And we were concerned at the time of chytridiomycosis, which is an amphibian disease, which is primarily passed on between animals. And also toads have a bufotoxin, which they expel, which is this white substance. So it protects them if they get attacked by an animal. And it can be extremely annoyance to an animal. So it can get in your eyes and sting. Um, I thought it kind of smelled like peanut butter, but it would, definitely irritate your skin if you got it on you. And that was the insertion of the pit tag. Uh, over the years, the data collection changed. The problem with handwriting data is that there's a lot of mistakes. And when you're, the tag numbers are often 15 digits long. So one mistake and you basically have renamed the animal. Uh, some of the data has changed again. I'm kind of just showing, you know, we had, when we did an analysis of our database, which was over 15,000 encounter records, we found that there was about a 10% error rate in the number of, of uh, mistakes in the handwritten data. So the data collection over the years, it would take over hours of, of just manual enter. But I got to thank all of these volunteers that came out and helped. Um, over time, it wasn't, just the two biologists that would go out, we would often there would be tortoise um, surveyors that would come out after 15 hour days, you know, getting paid, would volunteer eight hours at night and drive up and drive back in the same night to help us collect this data, mainly because they really wanted to work with something other than a desert tortoise. But I think the toad surveys were also a lot of fun. Um, first, now this was again, this was a talk I gave at a, um, at a science conference in 2020 in San Diego, but this is the methods where you basically you go out and you mark uh, at least twice within a year. Uh, typically we went out in May and June and you analyze it that the population is closed during that time and you put it in this program called program mark and it spits out an estimate. You know, it gives you an upper range and a lower range at each population. So within those four, uh, parcels that we showed you earlier. Here's kind of all of the different spots that we went to. Uh, this screen is kind of, okay, there we go. So these, these are all the parcels. And as you can see, by about 2013, because the toad was no longer 
uh, warranted for listing in 2010, a lot of private landowners in the valley that weren't afraid of the listing started to let us on their property, which was really great, but it also became a problem in that we couldn't go to every single property in the valley. And so we deviated from the surveys, but at some of the results, so again, I mentioned we had over 15,000 counter events. Uh, over those years, we put in over 10,000 tags into every individual toad that we found. And we only tagged individuals that were over 50 millimeters. And so we averaged about 850 per year. And the range again here, depending on the number of people we had, could be as number as 400 toads to over 1,500 toads um, encountered within that year. So that's a lot of data. It's a lot of animals. Uh, it was a lot of work. Uh, usually for two weeks out of the year in Beatty, Nevada. And again, I mentioned that we changed our survey methods at about 2014 to 2017 because we were interested in expanding the known range of the Amargosa toad. So our, our results, what everyone was really excited to know, um, again, when originally we thought there were only hundreds, you know, to order to 30 toads reported in the valley on those public lands, the private lands showed that there, you no, know, there are probably thousands, if not more, because we're not doing all of the private lands every year. But on these five parcels, we had an estimate anywhere from 3,000 to about 1,500 toads on average. Um, here are some of the properties. So again, we mentioned Torrance, Mullen, and Spicer. Torrance was later purchased by the Nature Conservancy, so they do a lot of restoration. Here's the Spicer property that I mentioned earlier. Um, and again, this is probably the second highest population just within this section of this valley. There's always around anywhere from 500 to 1,000 animals moving around these areas. The Harlan Keel, which included Shirley's property, her backyard, toads are very adapted to that area to garden areas or anywhere there's water leaking out. So hoses, um, they're very adapted to the city because of the lights. The lights attract the bugs and people, you know, attract uh, cockroaches sometimes. And so the, the toads are very adapted to the urban interface between the wildlife or the wildlands and the springs. But again, water is the key. So if there's water nearby, you're likely to find toads. Angel's Ladies, which we lost access to because the landowner died in 2013. And we haven't been able to get back on. And that population also remains stable, but it was also home to our largest animals, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, this is the Beatty River, though, around the town of Beatty. And this is our most robust, largest population. It typically has over a thousand toads. And depending on how many surveyors you get out there, again, we're not doing the entire river, but just within this section from this road to approximately where the stagecoach is, we encounter uh, hundreds and hundreds of toads. And there's typically a thousand just within this section. Here's a toad breeding ball that we found at night. Now, Michelle mentioned the Amargosa toad is silent. So the only way you can find them at night is using a headlamp and if you hear them, but coming around the bend, I heard this loud commotion of, of toad screaming and it was a large uh, breeding ball of males on, you know, and this is, this is kind of a rare sight in that valley, but that's the only time, basically the alarm call is basically to tell other male toads like, hey, I'm a male, like, or it's basically a release call. So the females are silent. Um, again, here's some of the other properties we went to, the Parker Ranch, the Weil Ranch. There's a lot of sections that we started to survey after 2013. But some of the most exciting was the expanded reach into the what was then the Coffer Ranch or the 7J Ranch, which was also purchased by TNC in 2017, I believe where we found the expanded range. So before they were only known in 10 miles of the Amargosa River, this probably expanded their known range by five miles and which also included Springdale, Roberts Field. Um, we also, the state protected speckled dace occurs on these areas and also a uh, spring snail which occurs in this valley. So again, I mentioned, these are some of the original transects where the red squares are uh, some of the greens were from the surveys from 2002 to 2016. And then in 2017, we found that expanded range. So it went from a known range of about 10 miles to about 15, which is really exciting. And we're continuing in the valley and they're, they're in a lot more. So this range is probably 15 to 20. 
And what's the benefit of getting to know these private landowners is they can do beneficial things that help them as well. Uh, one of the worst things we mentioned, um, Jess mentioned about the invasives are the bullfrogs up there. Now bullfrogs got into Nevada in, in the late 1800s. They're not from around here. They're from the Southeast United States and they eat everything. This is an adult 73 millimeter toad. And this is about your average size of the toad. Here's a, also a lizard that it swallowed in its stomach. And unfortunately the river is, is a very, um, anytime you make ponded habitat and make dams and walls, it really benefits the, the, uh, the bullfrog. So we can work with the areas within the river to remove artificial berms, get rid of the ponds. And so it helps lower the, the very bad bullfrog, which eats everything. It eats bats, birds, mice, everything. Um, tamarisk are another thing that it sucks a lot of water from the springs. So this landowner, you know, removed this giant tamarisk and then they found that the water, you know, started to flow more. So it, it is good for them. Uh, they get more water, but it also allows more water for some of the species which occur in the valley. And here's uh, Shirley uh, overseeing a restoration project in the Amargosa River with a lot of the partners. Also, the private lands oftentimes are in better shape than some of the public land because the landowners are there, you know, they're not allowing a lot of trespassing. They really want to take care of the land themselves because if they're grazing, uh, things like burrows, um, they're managed, but they eat any, uh, anything like a burrow, oftentimes when it grazes, it pulls the roots from the bottom of the grass. And so it can completely decimate parts and sections where they're allowed. Whereas on the private land where there's just cattle, they don't graze it to completely barren earth. So the toads actually do better on some of the private lands. And the landowners, you know, manage the water so that it keeps flowing and get rid of the invasive weeds, which also a problem for them. Again, I mentioned these are the population estimates and this is more of, these are the graphics that confirmed my estimates uh, with BioWest analysis. So we sent it out to basically a third party they reran the analysis and they uh, decided, you know, they came up to, or they did their own estimates to see if they could, how they compared to our analysis. Uh, they also looked at survivorship. So again, mentioned this, this red line indicates the years that we consistently went to all the habitats. After 2013, we didn't go to all the habitats. So although it looks like the population is down, you can't really compare the two because we didn't go to all the areas. Um, so demographics, what this means is, you know, how long are the toads surviving? And we found that 50% of the toads, we recaptured them within the first year. And most of them were, or a little under half, were one to 11 years in the recapture. But the recaptures mostly occurred that, that first year. And they remained, um, So we also, so I guess this says that there are four toads that they found after 10 years to, to show that. Um, the sex ratio is mostly, uh, there are mostly females and the females are larger in the valley. Again, I mentioned these are the average size. The average female was 77 millimeters on males 73.4, but you know, some of, we have a few outliers and I'll get to some of those in a bit. This 150 was probably measured wrong, but we had some of these larger animals, particularly at the Angel's Lady site. Now it didn't show up earlier, but, oh, I, I guess it is coming up, Never mind. So one of our longest recorded animals was an animal that was tagged at 95 millimeters in 1998 and 12, uh, subsequently captures, and it was at the clothing discouraged pool at the brothel, which uh, it's a basically a warm hot spring that the landowners would keep clear vegetation. They would try to get rid of the bullfrogs. And when it was last encountered, it was 105 millimeters. And to get to 95, if you think about it, that animal is probably already five or six years old. And so its age is anywhere from 15 to 17 year old toad maybe even older, which is a very long time for an amphibian, but these hot springs with the constant temperature 
means it was probably a very nice spot for it to live at. And this is, this is that pool that I mentioned before previously. And this is a large animal that we found out there. It was 108 millimeters long, but it was also 100 millimeters wide. And this is what they look like when they're gravid and full of eggs. So it was like a dinner plate size. And for some reason, some of our largest animals were there at this property. So movement, uh, again, because we have a tag in this toad, we can track if we catch it somewhere else, we can see where it's going or where it's been. Most of the animals stayed right by the water or on the property that they were initially captured. But we did have some that moved uh, two miles and our largest one was six miles. It went all the way from the upper part of the valley at the Harlan Keel to the river. And you know, six miles is pretty, pretty far for a small little toad to occur or to range. Um, the habitat that we found these in, this is kind of just coincidental encounters. There needs to be a more in-depth habitat study of these, but most of them were stream and river habitat around the water. Uh, um, some of the urban environments, which included Beatty, around the town of Beatty, is you would find toads that were in gardens, were you know, in street lamps, up by a building or by a garden hose. But uh, bare earth doesn't really tell you much, but a lot of people just found them out in the desert. So, but mostly they need water. That's the primary thing. And most of the time they are found within five meters to in the water at nighttime. Uh, this, this analysis is your survival. So what this is saying is you have a 50% survival rate based on what we captured. So that toad is from year to year living has a 50% chance of survival, which is pretty typical. Um, so here's the analysis again of our population estimate and it reflects that there are 3,761 toads from 1998 to 2013. You know, the upper of that is 4,763 and the lower of that is 3,000 in the estimate uh, in the confidence interval. So there are thousands of animals on these properties alone. Uh, BioWest also helped upgrade our database. A member I showed you that, you know, entering data by hand, there can be a lot of mistakes, but with access, database entry, and with upcoming technologies of tablets, you can enter this data and it doesn't allow you to add a mistake or erroneous errors. It will tell you to start again until it, until it, you put something in that it makes sense to it. Um, if you want, look up uh, David Spicer and some of the stuff that he's done and worked with. You know, he's a rancher and miner and conservationist. Um, he's done a lot of good things for the toads. And he's also invited a lot of people into Beatty for tourism, which um, in a lot of these rural towns of the economies, you know, are, are based a lot on the tourism of people going into Death Valley. And he's really capitalized and really, um, really helped us out with the Amargosa toad. And there's an NPR story, if you're interested as well, on some of the partnerships that we made with local landowners. And, you know, Dave Spicer has also started a bike trail. Uh, he invites a lot of people that go into Mammoth area. So it's a neat area to learn about toads, but also is a, is a neat exploration into this part of Nye County. And um, again, I mentioned how the ESA was kind of controversial at, at its time, but we now have in Nye County landowners because of these partnerships over 20 years um, we have private landowners who want endangered fish for recovery purposes on their properties, which is kind of unheard of in this region where people originally were driving around with uh, kill the pupfish um, bumper stickers now want to help us with, um, with recovery of some of these species. So that's just some of the stuff that we're working on in the valley right now. Some of the information out there is kind of wrong if, if you if you've seen these in books, uh, the range they put here was wrong. It was in the Amargosa Valley and not the Oasis Valley. Um, we didn't really get to consult much with this. And again, this paper that I just talked about was just published or it was just given out in 2019. But it's also the problem with gray literature. A lot of the stuff that I work on doesn't really get into the published um, peer reviewed scientific papers. And so a lot of this stuff gets printed and I, I feel like is wrong. 
But um, we have a lot of future studies. We need to know the genetics of some of these animals and toads across the landscape. We need to um, dig into the kind of surveys we're going to do in the future. Um, on the analysis of a lot of our toads in Nevada, this is kind of a broad view, but we actually have a lot of unique species here. A lot of these circles are different because, uh, let me point out to you right here, the Hot Creek and Railroad Valley toad were just found to be new species. They've always been there, but genetically they looked at them recently and determined that the ones in these valleys uh, were also, you know, like the Amargosa toad, more divergent from Western toad. So we're working on knowing what the range is and working with private lands up there, see if we can get on and know the, the status of, of the toads in these valleys. Uh, we also have toads that occur in right across the border in California that we don't know how different they look from the ones we also know about in Ash Meadows. And so that's something else I'm interested in looking at. Um, because there's common species or similar species within this valley. So it's likely that there's also toads that were in this area. There's a lot of flood events. Um, the Amargosa River did actually flow from Beatty all the way into California during a flood in 2013, I believe. 14. It's been many years out there. So conclusion, uh, we you know, with our partnerships with private landowners, uh, can't thank them enough. The known 10 mile range has expanded. We're continuing to find interesting things and work with landowners to get rid of invasives, get rid of uh, invasive tamarisk. And, and um, yeah, I'll leave you with this video of spawning activity in May in the daytime of the toads after a spawning event. And so these are also important for other wildlife, for birds, migratory birds also eat these, but it's an important component and it lets you know the health of the water, which everything depends on in the desert. Uh, if you have any other questions or if I might have messed something up, if you have any <laughs> inconsistencies or questions you need to ask me, please email me and uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and thank you Jess, Michelle and Abby for letting me talk about some of the work I did. Thanks. All right, thank you Kevin. So like he mentioned with all those invasives and things like that, you guys can actually play a really big part by helping support our new Don't Ditch a Fish program through which we encourage people to not ditch their fish or other pets or plants. And a lot of people may think that they are setting their fish free, but can actually grow to be super massive. They can become invasive and cause problems for the whole habitat and ecosystem. And on top of all of that, it is illegal to release your fish. So really consider if a fish is right for you before purchasing it. They can live for a pretty long time. The average lifespan of a goldfish is 10 to 15 years, while the oldest recorded goldfish was 43 years old. If you need to rehome your fish, try to look at other options like giving it to a pet shop, selling it to someone, donating it to a school or office, things like that. We just want to pass it on to a responsible owner. And Don't Let It Loose is another great program that's similar to Don't Ditch a Fish. And if you go onto the website, then onto the Nevada page, it'll give you a whole list of pet shops that are part of the Don't Let It Loose community. All right, so just to wrap it up, um, our species, especially our native species, can run into some water troubles. So quick notes, Invasive alien species have devastating impacts on native biota, causing a decline or even extinction of native species and negatively affecting that ecosystem. The issue of invasive alien species is caused by human activities mostly. Loss of bio biodiversity will have major consequences on human well-beings as well. This includes the decline of food diversity. It will also have an important impact on our economy and culture. Prevention will be our first step, but where the damage has been done, it can't, it's 
can be reversed, but it takes a lot of work and a lot of us working together. So with that, we will wrap it up with questions that we haven't answered yet. I see one that Kevin can answer on if we've been able to get angels, um, the angels site back, if we've talked to the new owners. Um, I have, uh, well, the last that I tried is they lived out of state. Um, they didn't live in Nevada and just occasionally, and they have an on-site manager, but coordination's been, uh, it's been hit or miss, but it would be good to get back on, but there's, uh, there's a lot of new sites that are online, so I, I would like to. I haven't lately, though, talked to that landowner. All right, we'll answer a couple more questions. And since it's seven, we're going to um, wrap it up pretty quick. So here are all of our emails. Take a screenshot, take a picture, whatever works for you. And let us know if we didn't answer anything. 